I'd like to acknowledge the country that we're on today and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and um, acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, this is the title of my talk this morning. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child wellbeing includes safety, health, culture and connections, mental health and emotional wellbeing, home and environment, learning and skills, empowerment and economic wellbeing. These wellbeing domains are interrelated. For example, having access to material basics is essential for full participation in learning and education which contributes to safety and security. The experiences that children have in their early years set the stage for their lifelong well-being. The majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and communities provide supportive, loving and positive environments for children, despite the history of dispossession and the continuing reality of child removal and trauma. Growing up with a connection to and an understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures acts as a strong protective family uh, factor for children and families. Research confirms the link between culture, child development and well-being and demonstrates that interventions that include opportunities for the expression of cultural identities are associated with improvements in health and well-being. Despite the resilience of our people, there are many families who experience disadvantage and vulnerability. Adverse childhood experiences are a strong predictor of social and health challenges that have a cumulative and lasting impact. Spending time in out-of-home care is often a result of those adverse experiences. Children who are placed in out-of-home care are then at risk of a number of negative health and social outcomes. This burden falls disproportionately on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children who are 10.6 times more likely to be removed from their families. The long-term impacts of adverse experiences for members of the stolen generations are well documented, with clear evidence that removing children from their families and cultures has ongoing negative health and wellbeing outcomes. While the National Framework's focus on priorities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children has improved in recent years, we have not seen a reduction in the number of our children entering care, and overrepresentation continues to rise year on year. We know that the status quo is not working for all children, but particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. As we continue to witness the escalating numbers of our children entering care, we know the only way to address this crisis is through a fundamental shift in approach that places the self-determination of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and communities at the centre. Access to quality, culturally safe services, including maternal and child health and universal services, family support, and early childhood education and care are essential for the safety, development and well-being of children and for turning the tide on the crisis of removal facing them. The evidence tells us that the solutions to the crisis we face are not to be found in the child protection system. This is because contrary to prevailing assumptions, the complexity facing many children does not just build over time. Many are born into families who are already facing complex challenges and intergenerational histories of adversity. It is critical that we recognise that the current system is not designed to address these forms of complex trauma and harm. These are issues that require service responses from across systems that sit outside the traditional child protection response, including primary health care, disability, economic policy, education and justice. Investment in children from conception through their first five years of life will have the greatest impact on addressing disadvantage and improving lifelong outcomes. Because inequity trajectories start early. Pregnancy, birth and early childhood are critical transition periods for families, especially mothers and infants. For expectant mothers, experiences of disadvantage are closely linked to a range of factors that affect healthy development of children during pregnancy and early in a child's life. Recent work undertaken at the Australian Centre for Child Protection in South Australia examined the trajectory of 280 families subject to a notification of harm and the types of concerns that brought them 
to the attention of child protection. And we have Leah's going to give us a, a, a look at this trajectory later on this afternoon. Um, and she has only five minutes to do it, but I urge you to take notice of what she's saying. It's, um, uh, I, so I had a look at it the other, the other week, and uh, it's quite a challenging um, and confronting piece of uh, uh, data and information. Children are born into families experiencing mental illness, family violence, drug and alcohol misuse, housing instability and welfare dependence. These children then often go on to experience risk factors that mirror those of the adults in their lives, such as developmental vulnerabilities, youth justice involvement, teen pregnancy and unemployment. These personal, familial and social issues can prevent parents from providing the positive, safe and nurturing care environment that is needed for a child, particularly when these factors occur in multiple combinations. This is often an intergenerational cycle. Children and young people who are known to child protection systems often go on to have their own children into the system. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples, the drivers of child protection involvement are a consequence of the economic, social and political context in which our children live. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island children and families are impacted by the shifts in federal and, and state and territory government policies and programs over time. Poverty, housing instability, poor physical and mental health, family violence and substance misuse are themselves the consequences of historical and continuing racism and discrimination within public policy and the broader society, including in particular the intergenerational harm caused by the forced removal of um, the stolen generations. Effective strategies to promote health and well-being for our communities must reflect an acknowledgement that historical acts like the stolen generations have caused a level of adversity that has profound impacts on our people that have been long lasting and across communities and from one generation to the next. This is not to place blame or guilt on present day Australians, but to help us understand the context of today's challenges. There were 17,150 living stolen generation survivors in 2018. The most recent data available for 2015 found that there were 114,800 descendants. Research undertaken by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has found that children living in stolen generations households experience the impact of intergenerational trauma through poor health, poverty and poor school attendance. Promoting a population health approach which focuses on outcomes and strategies for improving well-being across entire families and communities is a key to addressing the vulnerabilities experienced by our children and young people. We know that better outcomes for children and family wellbeing are achieved when we have control over our own lives and can address the challenges facing our communities. The work of Michael Chandler within First Nation communities in Canada has found that self-determination, meaning where communities have agency over their lives, is associated with lower rates of youth suicide. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get my... I can't explain it, but I don't understand it. Um, strategies to improve child development and wellbeing must include unremitting commitment to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander governance and partnerships with our organisations and communities to provide leadership, guidance and oversight of reform processes. We think it is essential that this include a dedicated National Commissioner for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people who can focus on advancing the rights of our children who experience disproportionate levels of discrimination and disadvantage. This is also to ensure that the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people are prominent in formal policy making. Despite the National Framework's commitment to a public health approach to child and family wellbeing, we have not seen a significant refocus of efforts to invest in prevention and early intervention services. For example, evidence from the first thousand days model shows that early education and care can play a vital role in giving all children a fair start in life. These benefits are particularly significant for children experiencing disadvantage. Unfortunately, across Australia, there are striking disparities in access to Commonwealth funded childcare services. In 2018, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children attended these services at half the rate of their non-Indigenous peers. 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander early years services, such as multifunctional Aboriginal children's services and Aboriginal child and family centres, provide culturally centred, community based childcare services and offer many additional forms of child, family, and community supports. Community controlled early years services have been shown to engage children and families who have not previously accessed early childhood education and care. The inequity in early childhood education and care enrolment is likely exacerbated by the introduction of the new child care package, which replaced a budget based funded model for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander early years services with a user pays model. SNAIT's membership continues to report reduced rates of participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, which has placed the long-term sustainability of these vital services at risk. In addition, there continues to be many examples of policies and forms of structural disadvantage that have a direct impact on family wellbeing and have been developed without the knowledge and expertise of our communities. These policies have had negative impacts and led to entrenched poverty and disadvantage. The continued expansion of the cashless welfare card, for example, which restricts the freedom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, has been shown to increase financial hardship. And a number of studies have found no positive outcomes across a range of indicators, including child health, child neglect, or developmental outcomes. Our communities and families need to be empowered to have a greater say over their lives. That is why we are encouraged by the Prime Minister's announcement at the release of the 12th Closing the Gap report uh, a fortnight or so ago that the National Indigenous Australians Agency will be developing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander early childhood strategy in partnership with our communities and organisations. I want to acknowledge the tireless efforts of SNAKE's members who have been working to support our children and families and and calling for early childhood policy reform for many decades. Their advocacy has been crucial in achieving this commitment. This strategy places Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children at the centre of the next phase of closing the gap. The draft targets in their current form include targets to improve de developmental incomes for our children and to reduce the number of children in out-of-home care. We are hopeful that the next iteration of the national framework will reflect the key actions contained within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Early Childhood Strategy and serve as a coordinating point for collaboration between Australian governments, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the non-government sector to drive better outcomes for our children. Achievement of wellbeing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children depends on a complex interplay between individual, child and family factors and broader community and societal factors. This means that focusing on well-being domains such as mental health or education to the exclusion of all others will compromise overall child well-being. What is required to ensure children grow up safe and well is commitments and actions from across multiple sectors. Underpinning all actions is the principle of supporting connection to family, culture, community and country for our children. It starts with the foundational support needed to ensure that families and communities have the tools they need to enable their children to thrive. From safe and stable housing, access to income and material basics and maternal and child health services in the antenatal period, to family violence and mental health responses early on for families who are experiencing vulnerabilities. Integrated systems where legislative, institutional and sector systems work together to improve outcomes for children and families have long been viewed as a best practice approach to engage with and respond holistically to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. Integrated service systems seek to ensure access to services and programs through multiple entry points that engage families based on their needs at different points in their life course. Those driven by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership are seen to offer the greatest capacity to shift trajectories of children particularly those exposed to factors that influence their entry into the out-of-home care system. In practice, integrated service delivery models often function as a one-stop shop and include a range of services such as early childhood education and care, health screening and programs such as maternal and child health, speech pathology and occupational therapy. Family supports and referral pathways 
to specialist services such as housing support, mental health and centrelink. This is an approach that is, that is designed to respond to the complexity of family life through access to the quality, universal and targeted services that these models, for these models to be effective. And for these models to be effective, there needs to be alignment of policy goals, investment approaches and indicators of achievement across government department and service sectors. There are a number of service responses that are achieving success in supporting families to prepare for their lives as parents and to assure a healthy start for children. The Nurse Family Partnership Program, delivered by Aboriginal community controlled organisations across the country, is a voluntary child home visiting service for mothers of Aboriginal children during pregnancy and up to two years post birth. Nurses and Aboriginal community workers support mothers to stay healthy during pregnancy, make their homes safe for them and their families, access relevant services, set goals and work out ways to reach them, develop job skills or continue education and connect with other mothers. Data from the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress Nurse Family Partnership Program indicates that families who attended were 62% less likely to have an episode of substantiated neglect. This reflects the important role that maternal and child health services can play in reducing adverse childhood experiences. For families who are already involved with the child protection system, we are seeing positive results for our children across the continuum, from efforts to prevent entry into care to supports that enable children living away from their birth parents to maintain the highest level of cultural connection possible. The common thread among these approaches is the focus on enhancing protective factors and building resilience, two key factors for promoting health and wellbeing within communities that experience adversity and multiple forms of disadvantage. In Queensland, 33 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Family Wellbeing Services are providing early intervention support to families experiencing vulnerability. These services embed a culturally safe and responsive approach to practice that reflects family and community strengths. Early data indicates that these services have achieved half the rate of renotification to the department when compared to mainstream organisations. For our children who cannot safely remain at home, pl placement with kin and family is essential for nurturing and sustaining the connections to family, community, culture and country that are so important to their sense of identity and well-being. In the Northern Territory, a number of Aboriginal community controlled organisations are taking the lead in trialling a new model of kinship care developed by Tumangia Council that provides a comprehensive approach to identifying, recruiting and supporting Aboriginal family and kin carers since these programs were introduced, there has been an 18% increase in the number of children placed with Aboriginal carers. And just to conclude now, I've been given the wind up, so I will honour that. Thanks, Stella. Um, the data shows that we still have much work to do so that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children grow up well and have every opportunity to thrive. Through the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Early Childhood Strategy and the Beyond 2020 Agenda, we have an opportunity to build service systems that support our children to grow up safe and well. And we look forward to partnering and working on this together. Thank you.